So yes, welcome everyone. I really appreciate you all joining us um, today. This is actually an extension of the a workshop that I'll be leading um, for the rest of the afternoon for our wonderful first year residents. So thanks to them for joining us um, for your lunch break. Uh, I also was supposed to be um, presenting this topic to the faculty in May, um, and that was canceled uh, as our faculty development day was canceled because of the pandemic. But to be honest, um, this topic is obviously um, very important for, I would like to thank all of us um, who are here on this um, session in this shared space today. Um, it does not matter if you're in a clinical space or not affects us um, in all realms of our work, um, but it really affects us as to how we, you know, navigate the world as human beings. So um, as Melissa has us um, contemplate what's happened over the past 24 hours, um, I can't imagine a more important topic to perhaps be discussing today is we consider ways of how to bridge difference in a very um, a uh, sad state of affairs that our country is in right now, I do believe um, having opportunities to really spend time talking about issues around bias is one very important um, first step in trying to bridge the differences that are challenging us today. Um, this is an incredibly complicated topic, and so I'm actually really thrilled that I have two other co-facilitators uh, with me, so thrilled to have Drs. Adrian Hampton and Vinnie Minicello um, with us to help us ground this work. So, uh, Adrian, Vinnie, as uh, most of you will all know, are some of our um, esteemed experts in the practice of mindfulness, and they will really help us try to center this work. So, again, very appreciative to have them join us as well. So just to get started, um, I and my colleagues, we have no financial disclosures. And as Melissa mentioned, this is recorded. So you may uh, view this in the future. So Adrian, I'm going to turn this over to you. Good afternoon. Um, so we would like to begin by just inviting everyone to take a pause. Um, implicit bias is a charged topic um, and it challenges us um, to see parts of ourselves and our culture um, and our friends and family and loved ones um, in, in a light that allows for change and allows for growth but is complicated and hard to see. Um, and so I'll invite you to ground yourself and center yourself for the conversation ahead. Feel your feet on the floor. And then just take three deep breaths. And then notice what emotions arise as you anticipate our conversation. And if you're not naming emotions specifically, just checking in with sensations that come up in your body. And now take three additional deep breaths. All right. We are here in the space together. Jennifer, back to you. Thank you. So the objectives um, 
for our uh, hour together will be we'll quickly define explicit and implicit bias. And we'll try to explore particularly implicit bias. And rather than just sort of leave you there, we're actually going to talk about strategies to help us mitigate our implicit biases. So we'll present you with some evidence based strategies. So I'm first going to show you um, a picture of this iceberg. Just to give you kind of a visual metaphor. So while there's explicit bias, which is perhaps what we can see on the surface, um, we're going to spend a lot of time focusing on implicit bias, which is that large mass that's probably um, that's lurking there underneath the surface. So as we talk about explicit bias, I'm going to give you um, these uh, ways of trying to think about it. So we can think of explicit bias as something that's expressed directly, something that we are aware of. It operates uh, consciously for each of us. And an example is, I only want to see a white doctor. And of course, that's not usually how it goes, right? There are uh, plenty of instances where the statement is, I only want to see, or I don't, I, uh, only, sorry, so I only want to see a white doctor, but it's often more common to hear, I don't want to see a black or brown doctor. Implicit bias is what is expressed indirectly. It's something we are generally not aware of. It operates in our subconscious. And an example in this case might be that uh, when perhaps you're getting on a bus, um, Maybe you're not aware that you are uh, trying to avoid sitting next to the black man on the bus. So let's focus on implicit or what some people call unconscious bias. So I'm going to share with you this quote. There is nothing more painful to me at this stage of my life than to walk down the street and hear footsteps and start thinking about robbery then look around and see somebody white and feel relieved. So does anyone have any ideas of who may have said that quote? And I'm hoping that some of you can unmute yourselves um, during this. I believe it was Jesse Jackson, wasn't it? Yes, so thanks, John. So this was actually the Reverend Jesse Jackson. Um, and so he said this in 1993, and uh, this is an example of internalized racism, that our biases are so strong um, and culturally embedded that even uh, one can develop biases against one's own identity groups. So, of course, Jesse Jackson being uh, uh, an esteemed um, civil rights activist who is an African-American himself. So what is implicit or unconscious bias? It's a form of rapid cognition that finds patterns based on small bits of information. It's primitive and adaptive, and it's a reflex that helps us detect danger. So it is actually an important skill set to have. It refers to social stereotypes that are positive or negative about certain groups of people that we form outside our own consciousness based on attitudes and stereotypes that we hold. And you could say that attitudes are those evaluative feelings that could be positive or negative, and stereotypes are traits that we associate with a category. These tend to develop early in our life, and they tend to strengthen over time. So I'm going to, again, ask some of you to unmute yourself. And if you're muted, I'd still like you to do this exercise with me out loud. So I'm going to ask you to state the color of the text. Um, so again, would love a few of you to unmute yourselves. So here we go. Yellow. Yeah. Yellow. Yellow. Red. 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 Green. 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 White. 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 Green. 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 Red. White. Red. 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 Green. 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 Red, 
green, green, green red, 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 yellow, yellow, white, yellow, white. 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 It's kind of hard, isn't it? <laughs> this is called a group test. We're going to do this again, okay? So if you're the same group, thank you so much for participating. So try this again. Yellow, So, um, would you say that it was easier to do the second time? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So now, of course, if you read Greek, it may not be, but I'm, I'm <laughs> hoping no one could read Greek. <laughs> um, so this is called the Stroop test. And what I'm trying to show you is how we are cognitively wired. In this case, to really, we are strongly biased to reading. Um, reading is uh, very much ingrained, something we are doing all day long. Um, and so it's not that we don't know what the colors are, but we preferentially want to read as opposed to identifying the colors. And this is related to the way implicit bias works. We just are hardwired to do things somewhat more intuitively than others. So let's again go back to implicit bias. Implicit racial bias, again, resides in our unconscious mind, and it is thought to be beyond our direct control. Uh, these unconscious attitudes are less egalitarian than what we explicitly think about race. I can't imagine that anyone on this call would explicitly say anything racist, um, though we may all have a, a lot of issues around implicit racial biases. And our refusal to talk about and confront issues of race reinforces implicit racial bias, so it is self-reinforcing. Um, at a talk I gave, uh, I think it was back in September about racism in medicine, we talked about um, this uh, book commissioned by Congress called Unequal Treatment. So amongst the conclusions of this work um, was the following. Although myriad sources contribute to these inequities um, in healthcare, some evidence suggests that bias, prejudice, and stereotyping on the part of healthcare providers may contribute to the differences in care Again, often despite providers' best intentions. Again, this is not intentional. And I'll show you this poster from the work that they're trying to do in Australia with Aboriginal people. So racism makes me sick. So the, even though this is not explicit, these implicit biases actually do affect people's lives. And then it's important to think about issues of, um, bias and burnout, because burnout is a very hot topic now. Many of us are burned out, especially with the coronavirus pandemic and then ongoing issues, of course, in, in the political stage, um, as evidenced in the past 24 hours. So we're all together here feeling some level of burnout, especially true in primary care. Unfortunately, the studies show the more burned out we are, the more biases we have as well. Um, I showed you this study, but it's worth showing you again. Um, this is uh, what I showed you back again in September. Uh, and again, a slide that comes actually from Tillman Farley. But this study basically shows when they look at physicians' um, implicit and explicit biases and then ask patients what they think of those physicians, um, again, if the clinician has very low explicit and implicit bias. Their patients, needless to say, um, adore them. Um, but interestingly, if the clinicians have relatively high explicit bias, to be honest, uh, patients are you know not thrilled, but they can deal with that. But what patients really cannot stand is if there is low explicit bias, but relatively high implicit bias. So patients can pick this up very easily. So let's talk about unlearning our implicit biases. How can we mitigate this? So I'm gonna give you a quote from Malcolm Gladwell who wrote the 
book, Blink, um, which is a great read, and it's all about implicit biases. He states, the answer is that we are not helpless in the face of our first impressions. They may bu bubble up from the unconscious, from behind a locked door inside of our brain, but just because something is outside of awareness doesn't mean it's outside of control. So I'm going to provide you some uh, evidence-based steps to, uh, I'll call it de-biasing. So there is an element needed of education, one of exposure, and then approach. And so um, it just so happens I was able to fit this into a handy mnemonic, so it is implicit, and we're going to go over each one of these steps. So we're gonna start with I, which is introspection. And so for our first year residents, part of your kind of pre-work for this was to do the implicit association test. So for those um, who are on this call, if you haven't done an IAT before, I really encourage you to go to this website um, sometime later today and take, uh, if not just the racial, um, IAT, you can also do one for gender, um, religion, um, and, and other categories. So I encourage you to try to take two of them. Consider of questions you might want to think about asking as you do this is how do you feel when you're taking this test? Um, how do you feel when you saw the results of your test? And then to think about um, what kind of experiences have led you to um, what biases are um, unveiled when um, you, you do this test. And if you haven't done it for a while, it's worth doing it again. I think it's important for me to share with you that to this day, I'm still slightly biased toward white people. Um, it perhaps is not surprising. I have a lot of issues of my own internalized racism um, that I, need to keep grappling with. Um, I'm a very assimilated um, Korean American who grew up in rural America. It's not surprising that I married a white man um, who's perhaps the uber white man, right? I, I married a British man. So um, these are all things that are worth reflecting um, and then really thinking about strategies to mitigate this. So just to review some um, studies that have come out of the IET tests, we know that at least 75% um, of people, if probably much more, um, do uh, demonstrate biases on the IET test, and millions of people have taken this test today. Um, and here are some uh, maps um, uh, to existing social hierarchies and stereotypes that have arisen. So generally, um, uh, the, the people participating in these studies favor men, white people, youth, heterosexuals, and the physically abled. There seems to be a strong association with men in science and women with liberal arts. So these are examples of what the IET has shown us today. Um, M for um, ways to mitigate implicit bias um, is about mindfulness. So first, of course, we wanna think about who we are, but then having a mindful approach is important. So there are studies such as this one that does show by engaging in mindful activities, one can decrease implicit bias against blacks and um, the aged. So I'm now gonna turn this over to Vinny again to um, give us a practice of how uh, we can do some um, strategies here that again, don't have to take up a lot of time. So Vinny, I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so this is a, a brief practice, the, again, going with the theme of a mnemonic, just to help us remember these sort of practices. This one is called TIES. Um, so the, it stands for thoughts, images, emotions, and sensations. So we'll just take a few moments to go through this practice just for what's showing up for us right here in this moment. Um, so here, again, eyes open, eyes closed, whatever feels most appropriate for you. Uh, maybe just taking a breath, just one deep breath, maybe a little bit of an emphasis on the exhale. And just in this moment, noticing if there are any thoughts that are present right now. 
Maybe the thoughts are jumping from one thing to another. Maybe the thoughts are sticking on one particular thing. And simply noticing the thoughts as they're there, not needing to change them or make them be anything different than what they are. And tune into uh, images. And what we mean by this is any particular mental images or any particular scenes that you can sort of uh, see playing out uh, before you right now, just in this moment. Maybe th stories uh, about what we're talking about, stories from your life, stories from the past, any particular images that might be present to you right now. And perhaps with the next exhale, just noting the emotions, the emotional quality of this moment right here. And this could be frustration. This could be joy. This could be excitement. This could be sadness. This could be weariness. This could be rage. And again, the intention here isn't for the emotions to be any particular way. It's just simply allowing them to be in our present moment awareness as they are. And finally, with the next exhale, allowing the attention to be drawn into any particular sensations that are present right here in this moment. Perhaps noting, noting any sensations in the throat. Uh, sometimes a tightness shows up there. Any sensations in the chest, belly. Noticing sensations of warmth or coolness of the extremities. Maybe even simply inviting in some awareness of the other senses in addition to touch. If there's anything particular visually or smell that you're noting in the quality of the air right now. A taste in your mouth. Again, noting that tendency perhaps to want things to be different than they are. And just allowing, allowing what sensations are present to be there just as they are in this moment. And with the next exhale, allowing the attention to return to the present and Jennifer. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to continue down with our mnemonic of implicit. So P stands for perspective taking. And I think this cartoon sort of gets at it, right? So how can we work at looking at things from the other's point of view? Imagine your doctor assumes that you're non-compliant. Imagine you're assumed to be seeking nar narcotics for your pain. Imagine you experience microaggressions every day. So this one, next one, L is learning to slow down. And I'm gonna try to uh, show you a video for this. So again, let me know if you can't hear this. In situations where we think we might be biased, we should probably slow down and maybe eat some breakfast. No, really, 
Take the study of judges handing out parole in Israel over three sessions in a day. They'd have a morning session, presumably right after breakfast. Then there'd be a snack, and then they'd have a second session. And then finally they'd have lunch, and they'd have a third session for the day, and that would be it. And they'd judge more harshly the longer they worked. They would hand out criminal sentences that were more harsh over the course of each session. Then they'd have the break, and they would be more lenient. Again. If you are one of the folks who are unlucky enough to show up in front of the judge near the end of the session, they are more likely to be punitive. Bias creeps in more easily the less focused and fresh we are. Haven't had a break? Hungry? Tired? Working too fast? Your subconscious might make a decision you don't agree with. But what we want to work toward is figuring out systems where we can look at a resume or we can look at a work product and we can know what we're looking for, be slow and methodical as we're doing it, and frankly be aware that we might have a bias that comes into play so that we know the correct for it. And this really matters. For example, in medicine, there's been research showing that sometimes black people get prescribed fewer painkillers than white patients, and that they sometimes get more amputations than white patients in similar situations. But some doctors have also found ways to improve. They were told race can be a factor in treatment and recommendation decisions unless people are careful. Every one of those doctors, regardless of their implicit bias levels, was able to self-correct. So we actually can, when we're making decisions where we have time, we can correct when our conscious values and when we're, when we're internally motivated to do so. So slowing down seems to help. And slowing down and being more aware might help even more. Next time, more solutions. So I, I sh wanted to share that video. There's actually a whole series of these videos with the New York Times from about four years ago. So um, that was called Snacks and Punishment. And so if you want to um, see the other, um, these short videos, I encourage you to look there. But definitely having time, and I know none of us feel like we have time, but time does make a difference in terms of our um, ability to decrease our implicit biases. Again, you know, thinking about this from a mindfulness perspective. So the next one, I, is individuate. So what do I mean by that? So obtain specific information. So, you know, rather than just thinking of that, that black man, for example, we start to really personalize who that person is. And then as we learn, we are now thinking of, oh, that's Doug, you know, the former semi-professional football player who does his best to try to provide Christmas presents to all of his grandchildren in Milwaukee, right? So specific information can help decrease implicit bias. Um, we should be thinking of counter stereotype exemplars. So what, what do I mean by that? So for example, when uh, someone says a Latin, uh, Latinx man, um, you know, rather than um, maybe think of something that conjures negative um, stereotypes, perhaps you could consider thinking of Lin-Manuel Miranda, right? Um, composer and, uh, and singer and Hamilton producer. Um, uh, you could think of, if we're trying to think of a black woman, you could think of Maya Angelou, right? So writer and activist. If someone, um, if you're trying to conjure up someone who's Muslim, think of Malala um, Yuchefsi, who's Nobel Prize, um, Peace Prize winner from Pakistan. Um, and, uh, you know, here's, here's the black woman we should be thinking about yesterday, right? This is Stacey Abrams, um, who is really responsible for the joyous things that were happening um, in our beautiful southern state of Georgia. Practice situational attribution rather than dispositional, so, um, or character attributions. So the example I'm going to give you is, uh, I'll t take my own family here. Um, someone uh, races past our car, and my husband wants to shout up that, you know, expletive jerk, right? And I interrupt and say, gosh, I hope he gets to the hospital in time to meet his new baby, right? So again, trying to turn that around into really thinking about situation. Maybe that's someone who's rushing to the hospital because his, you know, his partner is in, in labor. Like you, could, you could picture that instead in your mind. Um, so the example that I was thinking of, of 
my um, African-American patient, Doug, was. Um, he did no show for an appointment for me. But again, we know who Doug is. And so we thought, gosh, I hope Doug is OK. So rather than just thinking Doug is non-compliant, we called him. And it turns out, actually, he had stopped to help someone in distress um, because there was an accident on his way to clinic that day. And then increase opportunities for contact. So really, you know, make sure you're spending time with people who are different from you. So here are people who have really influenced me. This is um, Denise Rogers, who is Vice Chancellor at Rutgers and a wonderful mentor. Another very dear mentor of mine is Patricia Teesi Rome. Um, here's Brett Benali Thompson of the Ojibwe tribe, whose wisdom I have always benefited from. And this is um, this is Claudia Arcega. She was my very first MA, and she's now a physician assistant in um, Washington State. And then check your messaging. So these are some um, studies that actually I'm borrowing from the Wisely Center. Helped um, do a lit review and found some of these. So. One, uh, so this is all messaging that we should all be thinking about. It's very important to promote multicultural, not colorblind messaging. So colorblind statements increase both explicit and implicit racial bias in studies compared to multicultural statements. So it's really important to name that race does matter and that we should be celebrating being in multicultural, not colorblind spaces. This quote is very important. Remind yourself and others that, quote, the vast majority of people try to overcome their stereotypic preconceptions. So if you use this messaging, which I know is a bit of a mouthful, that actually did reduce weight, age, and gender bias compared to a message that stated, we all have bias. Okay, so you must believe that we are all trying to overcome our stereotypic preconceptions. Um, here's one that I hope some of you residents notice that I'm trying to do. So I talk a lot when I'm teaching to talk about how we are trying to work together as a team. So while using this language, there are studies that show that this led to greater trust in clinicians and better adherence compared to usual care. So use this phrase, we are working together as a team. Your patient is part of your team. And then this is also important. Empathy is malleable. So people um, are more empathic when they believe they can develop their empathy than when they believe it is fixed. So yes, it does seem that some people are really gifted with bedside manner, but that doesn't mean that others um, cannot learn how to do this well. And then I is institutionalized fairness. So use checklists. So checklists we know saves people's lives in the operating room. Um, so uh, you know many of you have been trying to experiment more with equity lens checklists. So here's an example of one um, that I've been promoting over the years. And in fact, um, in December, we had an open diversity, equity, and inclusion committee uh, meeting and again gave some um, prompts that were a sort of like a checklist to think about how could we continue to improve um, our public facing web page, right, by applying an equity lens. And using such kind of tools, we're hoping that we are promoting procedural and organizational change. And ultimately, we'd love to be moving towards social accountability, again, where we're really hearing voices of people, of communities, which are in the center. So again, moving away from this idea that it's the academic health center in the center or the, or the health system in the center with the communities on the outside, but kind of turning that inside out and putting people's voice and community voice at the center. That helps us be accountable. It helps us more naturally just move into more equitable outcomes. And then I will have us consider stereotype threat. So this um, is a concept where uh, stereotype threat refers to being at risk of confirming um, a negative stereotype about one's group. So the kind of classic example is um, you could be um, 
uh, having, uh, as I say, a grant application being uh, going up for an interview for a grant. And they walk down a hallway to uh, meet with um, the grant reviewers. And let's say it's an African-American woman. And she walks down this hallway that is lined with all these past presidents and other leaders, and they're all white men. So you have just primed this candidate to being reminded, oh my gosh, I'm a black woman. And she's going to go into this interview and the studies show that she is going to perform more poorly just because she has walked down that hallway. If you had hung different photos in that hallway, she would have performed differently. So that is stereotype threat. So we want to reduce stereotype threat. Um, so acknowledge that complex systemic and systematic challenges um, that people of color experience and acknowledge that race matters. So you want to start with that framework. We certainly want to make diversity visible and recruit and retain racial and ethnic minority providers and staff. And we do have opportunities to continue to survey our own uh, local work environments and to see how how do that um, how you know how does this space possibly provoke stereotype threat for people who will come in. And then one that's very important for me as an educator um, is that it's important that we just don't talk about health disparities. So it's really important to talk about health disparities in the context of the world that we're living in, um, which is one that includes issues of the isms, right? So sexism, racism, we have to sort of explore it in that context. And then finally, the last uh, T of implicit is take two which basically means you're not done when you get to the last T. So this is um, really um, a cry that we need to move beyond what, you know, traditionally has been called cultural competency, and that we would really uh, should be trying to aim for cultural humility. And I would define cultural humility as lifelong learning about oneself and those other to us. And so in summary, implicit bias has profound implications for the lives of our patients, our staff, and our colleagues, um, and so you know, our families, right? Um, we should apply evidence-based strategies to help us in working to combat our biases, and we should practice ongoing self-exploration and cultural humility. And so I'm, we're going to um, end this formal talk with Adrian. Thank you. Um, so this is another just quick check-in mindfulness practice um, developed here at the UW um, to uh, um, interrupt automatic decision making and make sure that we are aware in the present moment. Um, and so it's three P's, easy to remember, pause. Um, and so that's just stopping. And then the second, presence, can be as simple as taking a deep breath. If you're feeling generous and you have the luxury of time, you could take three or even five deep breaths, um, but it doesn't need to be elaborate. And then once you have arrived in this present moment, proceeding. So moving on with what you were going to do next. Um, so let's try it. We'll pause. And then three deep breaths. Nothing to change, nothing to do, just breathe. From this place of a more centered presence, we can proceed with our days. Back to you, Jennifer. Thank you. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I, so I just want to say I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. So thank you. 
is a question if you could just put it in the chat. I uh, will start a, a direct line to um, first to Dr. Minicello. So you um, have been uh, doing some mindfulness and training within residency. Um, and if you could comment just on this aspect of that um, is um, looking at kind of the evidence uh, for using this um, strategy. Thanks, Melissa. Appreciate it. Um, but again, this is this is definitely a, a hyper focused area of mindfulness and residency. Um, and I'll just share uh, a few ideas and and perhaps we can start to have some connections between the work with the residents and the work that we're talking about today. Um, if you look at the literature uh, of mindfulness and residency, it's uh, still pretty new still relatively new. I think some of the first studies that I've seen out there from 2015, um, the way that I think about it is really um, kind of twofold. And there's probably more, more factors to it, but I, just for simplicity, I'll, I'll kind of condense the research into two main categories. One is looking at how does mindfulness uh, impact residents um, on, a, on a personal level, right? Uh, and so there are a lot of research, a lot of uh, looking at specifically uh, burnout scales, looking at self-compassion scales, looking at depression, anxiety, um, those experiences that we know are very common in uh, residents and resident life. Um, and in general, trending towards positive, if not um, statistically significant, um, uh, positive associations between mindfulness training and those sort of personal uh, experiences that residents have. Um, the other kind of group that I think of is professional development. And, and uh, a lot of the research, more probably just in the last few years now, is looking at how is mindfulness training and residency um, actually in, enhance uh, residents' capacities as clinicians. Um, and so if, one of the things that we looked at was the um, the ACGME uh, recommendations for, um, for example, family medicine residents, uh, yeah, talking about communication skills, empathy skills, um, compassion, uh, ability to take feedback. Uh, there have been some really great studies that have shown that uh, through mindfulness training, residents are able to actually enhance all of those qualities that are actually part of the milestones for uh, for family medicine residents, um, and it's kind of interesting. It's not just it's not just primary care either. There's a, a really great um, there's really great work coming out of uh, UCSF. Uh, there's a general surgeon out there, Dr. Uh, Carter Labares, um, who developed a whole uh, center for mindfulness training for general surgery residents, uh, and noticing actually surgical skills improving through mindfulness training as well. Um, so very fascinating, uh, definitely a growing field, evolving field. And, um, you know, I think my sense uh, and my experience is the, the, the growth edge, the edge uh, that um, I think is really important to address moving forward is um, how is it that mindfulness training uh, has an impact on, for example, implicit bias? Mm -hmm. uh, how we um, influence bias in residents specifically, um, how uh, residents interact with the community, um, and and how that can enhance kind of community engagement, um, social responsibility, um, kind of taking it to the to the next level. Um, and I think there is preliminary research looking at that. Um, and I I do believe the the intention of mindfulness training isn't to put the onus on the individual that comes up a lot in the conversations like oh you just you're burnt out just do some more mindfulness you'll be good it's fine um obviously we all know that's that's not a great solution and um mindfulness training in and of itself uh, it does it enhances our ability to relate to our clinical experiences the healthcare systems that we work in and hopefully uh, transform it in the future hey, thank you yeah, uh, Dr. Hampton, I think a, a 
people would be um, may not know about the HEAL program that you're involved in, and I wanted to give you a chance just to talk about this innovative leadership program. Thank you, uh, on mute, on mute. There. Sorry. <laughs> Shameless plug. Um, I am part of an organization called the Institute for Zen Leadership. We have many alum on this call today. Um, and we um, offer a program for health professionals called HEAL, Healthy Embodied Agile Leadership. Um, and it is bringing meditative practice into life, including work life um, and how to leverage our most um, calm, centered, powerful version of ourself um, in the face of adversity, challenge, hardship, and just everyday life. <laughs> Great. Um, and Jennifer, maybe you want to take a crack at this question. Um, given the hard wiring process that only progresses with age, are there early interventions that can mitigate implicit bias beginning in childhood? Um, yeah, you know, I think I was just looking here. I think Dave, you were asking that question. It's such a great question. Um, I just sent a link. This is from the Kerwin Institute, which actually does a lot of really great, um, has a lot of great um, resources in this area. And so it actually looks like some of the strategies. So I was just looking at that article in an attempt to try to answer your question. Um, it looks like some of the strategies that I was talking about are um, applicable um, and uh, certainly something you could do with young children. Um, I will say, you know, just, you know, this is not, I'm not now talking from an evidence-based lens here. This is not my area of expertise, but, um, as a mother of, um, two biracial children, um, we've been talking about some of these topics about race, um, since really they were pretty young, um, children, uh, are capable of talking about these things. And I think there are probably, you know, I, I, I don't know if Ronnie Hyone is on this call, but Ronnie, um, it's amazing to me, the sort of books she's able to find that she shares with her um, um, now seven-year-old daughter, Maxine, um, that is now available to children. So for those of you who are parents or grandparents, I think you'll find a lot more opportunities to engage children with some um, beautiful children's books in this sub in this topic, but really it's this opportunity of exposure. So really making effort to try to um, bring children together um, and uh, in safe spaces um, uh, and to have, you know, thoughtful dialogue around this, whether it's in, um, you know, uh, or, you know, school or in, you know, um, other settings where, where children are going to be together, you know, Sunday school, things like that. I think there's plenty of opportunity to do so, but it does take we grownups to provide this intentional space for it. Um, even this morning, I think, Laura Cruz, I see that you're on, you were trying to figure out how do you talk to your 10-year-old about what happened yesterday, right? We, we yeah. have to... Yeah. So we, you know, we have to talk to our, figure out ways to talk to our kids about this. And um, I think what you don't want to do is um, think that the answer is to protect our children from this, right? We, we need to talk about it and we need to, um, you know, show the world as it is. And, um, and hopefully uh, by practicing doing that, we, we think of compassionate ways to bring children into this conversation. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful and a very important question because you're absolutely right, Dave, that these are all things that, um, you know, get ingrained, these biases get ingrained, you know, before, before we even hit kindergarten, to be honest, um, as you look at the study. So thanks. Um, there were a couple questions about if this session is 
being recorded. It is, and there'll be a recording available. And um, Dr. Ed Goose, if you will make your slides available, we'll, we could attach those to the email with the video. Um, great. And I have to be a little bit careful with my slide deck, just so you know, because actually this was given at um, FMX. So I think it's under some, some of these slides are sort of under their, uh, yes, they, they own some of these slides. Now. Okay. <laughs> but we can certainly make the uh, video available to everyone. Yeah, great. All right. And, you know, I will just echo, Melissa, what you were saying earlier. I just, um, I, I have found it a really hard 24 hours. And so I just really appreciate being in this space and seeing all of your faces and names here. Um, so really, uh, you know, this, this family is really important. Um, so glad we could spend this, this time together. <laughs> 